This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. Are you a tech-savvy developer with an inquisitive mind? SE Radio has an opening for a new volunteer host to join the team and produce five episodes per year. Contact show host Robert Blumen at robert.blumen, that's B-L-U-M-E-N, at gmail.com for details. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm Marcus Blankenship, and today our guest is Jerry Weinberg. Jerry Weinberg is a computer scientist, author, and teacher of the psychology and anthropology of computer software development. He's the author of over 30 books, including his most recent, Errors, Bugs, Boo-Boos, and Blunders, as well as The Psychology of Computer Programming and Introduction to General Systems Thinking. He was manager of operating systems development in the Project Mercury, which aimed to put a human in orbit around the Earth. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio, Jerry. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Hey, before we begin, let's make it clear for people listening. What's an error? Well, that's not an easy thing to answer. Because the same thing that is an error to you might be a feature to me. Uh, I'll give you an example. I think I have this in the book. Well, start with something that Alan Perlis told me years ago and that I didn't believe for a long time. He said, there's no such thing as a wrong computer program. And I thought, what? You know, that's ridiculous. And, And he said, no, there's no wrong programs. There's just different programs. And I had to think about that for quite a while. And I realized uh, something happened when I was at the university for a little while. We were trying to train computer operators. Uh, We had the new uh, multi-program machines that would run more than one program at the same time. So you may be running a dozen programs and something crashes the, the machine, crashes the operating system. And then the operator has to restart all these dozen programs, and it's not an easy job to do that. So we wanted to train operators to do that. But to do that, we needed to have a a program that would crash the operating system at random times, and then the operator would have to restart it. Well, we tried to write such a program, and we couldn't do it. We just couldn't make it crash the operating system at random times. And we were about to give up when somebody pointed out that there existed a program already that did that. Uh, The physics department had uh, been working for years to try to get this big simulation program going in in Fortran. And it it had the property that it didn't do the simulation they wanted, but always crashed the operating system at random times. And that was exactly the training program that we wanted. So to the physics department, it was a wrong program. It was an error. To us, it was a perfect program. Okay? So you see why defining what's an error is very difficult. Uh, It depends on the point of view, uh, very subjective, uh, of who is using it. So the very same program is both error or full of errors or perfect for somebody else. I think that's caused a lot of trouble and people talking about errors, is that, is that it's not a objective thing, right? And even the system that crashes the computer might not be an error. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And I noticed in the title of your book, you use three different names for errors. Maybe this gives us a hint. You use the terms bugs, boo-boos, and blunders. Is is there anything special about those three names? Or are you just bringing up the thought that how we refer to errors is important somehow? It's important because it's the start of our 
investigation into error in particular or errors in general uh, starts with our what we call them. And so, for example, in the industry, it's very common slang uh, to talk about bugs, all right? And uh, if we're thinking of bugs, and like I have a problem with uh, ants in my office, and, uh, you know, the ants come from wherever they come from, uh, but I didn't, I think I didn't cause them, right? They just decided to occupy my office. And uh, well, maybe I caused them. You know, I might have left a piece of candy around somewhere or, or a piece of a sandwich and they they feasting on it. But by and large, uh, bugs appear in the world through causes outside of our own control. And if you call a thing a bug, it's kind of like, I'm not responsible for this, right? And if I'm not responsible for this, that's the end of my search to try to prevent it. Does that make sense? It does. It sounds like when programmers have told me at times that, um, well, the software worked on their machine, so it must be my problem that it didn't work on my machine. Absolutely. Speaking of bugs, there's an ant crawling across my keyboard right now. Okay. And uh, it can't be my how does that differentiate between things like boo-boos and blunders, which seem uh, like a different uh, a different sort of error? Yeah, exactly. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how you define those slang terms, but a boo-boo is, um, you know, it's, well, I, I just uh, had a momentary lapse and uh, don't worry about it, it won't happen again. Uh, you know, it's, it's minor, right? It's a little, like a baby term, boo-boo, right? Uh, blunder, well, yeah, I made a big mistake. and uh, But of course, I won't do that again because uh, I don't blunder all the time. You know, these are the sort of impressions. They're not exact terms. And that's one of the reasons we try, uh, I tried in the book, to come up with uh, use, I didn't, I didn't invent it, use terminology that's a little more precise because the start of our search for errors and where they come from and what to do about them starts with being clear about what we're talking about. So I use uh, favor of the terms faults and failures. Failures are what we experience from a bug. Right? This program we're using doesn't do what we hoped it would do. It fails. I think that's fairly clear. Right? If it can fail in different ways, it adds one plus one and gets three. All right? That's a f probably a failure unless we're trying to do that. Or it takes too long to do the calculation, which is a different kind of failure. But where does that failure come from? There's something wrong in the program or in the hardware. And that's a fault. Right? like a, what causes earthquakes or faults in the earth. Right? Now, that term isn't perfect, but uh, because people think of fault and they think of blaming the fault some person, and it may not be a person at all, right? but it's the, it's the thing inside that causes the failure outside. So if we start to think about the errors we see, it sounds like we can think about them and start to categorize them as either faults or failures. And no, 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 not quite. See, we don't see faults. If that's not what we experience. A failure is what we experience. Fault is where the experience comes from. So if there's a somebody here who has a, a manager of a team that has software and they have a bug database or they have a list of bugs that have been reported, those are all experienced failures. Right. And why, how can we begin to, I guess, maybe work backwards to find faults? Uh, is this similar to what I've heard of a root cause analysis? Yes, that, that could be it. Uh, we also, I call it pinpointing. Uh, where did it come from exactly? And of course, there's uh, different views of that too. You can say, okay, I pinpointed the fault. The failure came from 
line of code that should have said add A and B, and it, it said it said subtract A from B. So it, that was the fault. Oh, but where did the difference come from? I mean, it, it didn't just creep into the machine. Somebody wrote the wrong line of code. So where did that come from? See, So you could say the fault was a human activity that led to the fault in the software. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I know that companies I've worked at oftentimes keep a list of failures, but I don't know if I've seen them keep a list of faults. Is it important that companies who want to improve quality start to pay attention to both? Well, yeah. Well, actually, the failures are not ultimately that important. If you want to improve, you have to know where the faults came from. All right? <laughs> then you, you go back and change the process that created these faults, okay? Or allowed them to slip through. So, for example, and this is a really good example, we studied, uh, Gary Okamoto and I, uh, he was a student of mine at the university, uh, and as a thesis, he, he studied the history of various failures and faults from uh, IBM operating systems going way back. And uh, he developed the idea of error-prone code. Right? where certain pieces of code seemed to be full of faults and others were quite free. And so the question came, how come certain pieces of code uh, are much more troublesome than others? And we uh, figured out some ways to identify them uh, by analyzing the patterns in the code, but we never figured out how come this piece of code was more error prone than this other piece of code. Some years later, I was talking to uh, Capers Jones about this, and he said, well, what they had discovered was that the error prone code was code that had actually skipped some steps in their code development process. For example, uh, code reviews. They would be in a hurry and they would say, well, we don't have time to do this reviewing or to finish our testing or whatever. And lo, lo and behold, they, they turned out to be the troublesome things, all right? So to correct that, you want to have a process that you actually follow all the time. And, and I ran into, uh, I'll never forget this, a um, client of mine, I was consulting with them, trying to help them find out where they were getting all their trouble with errors. And I asked them, uh, well, do you do code reviews? And he said, oh yeah, we do. And I said, well, when do you do code reviews? He said, well, we almost always do code reviews. And the word almost stuck in my mind. And I said, well, when is it that you don't do code reviews? Because I'm thinking this is where they skip a part of their process. And he said, well, sometimes the code is late and we're in a hurry, we don't have time to do the code review. Okay, and I said, okay, now let's do, let's do some root cause analysis here. How come the code is late? And he kind of didn't know why. So I said, let's go talk to somebody, some programmers who had some late code. And we went and talked to them. They said, how come your code is late? He said, well, because we had a lot of errors in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and so, so, in other words, translating what they were doing, when we had code that had a lot of errors in it, we skipped the part of our process that was designed to remove errors. And once you get clear, you see, and you're thinking about it, you, you start to see stuff. You say, okay, now we see what we're doing is really dumb, right? It's sort of the dumbest thing we can do. And I said, look, if you want to save time, Stop doing code reviews on anything except the stuff that's late, and you'll get a lot better results. And I'm not really recommending that because you never know when you're going to have errors. But they were doing exactly backwards of what they should have been doing. And because they didn't speak clearly about their errors, they didn't think clearly about their errors. Is that all clear? 
Absolutely. So thinking clearly and speaking precisely about the errors takes me to the next question. In, in the book, you assert that these errors, which I've almost always seen lumped together as bugs, are actually sources of information. And many companies don't view them that way. Maybe you've already answered this, but what kind of information can errors reveal and how do we begin learning from them rather than just trying to sweep them under the rug? Well, first step is not sweep them under the rug. You know, in other words, not just fix something. Typically, uh, what happens is an error comes up, a failure comes up, and the, there's a press on to fix it and get it done quickly and get things going again. So the first step is to extract the information that's there. You know, uh, how did this happen? And then we can go and say, what are we doing that will make this happen again? And like the example I just gave, if what we're doing was skipping the step in our process, the error tells us, stop skipping this, right? Uh, an error, uh, a pattern of errors that comes up might tell us there's something wrong with our training of programmers, right? We've had uh, an example of this. Uh, we had one client some years ago, uh, they kept making off by one errors. Do you know what I mean by off by one error? Yes. Okay. So uh, they, they had a lot of these and I, they weren't doing anything in particular about it. So I said, we look together at the patterns and we keep doing this over and over again. How come? And so, so we backed up, backed up, and said, okay, we taught our programmers and we didn't really make it clear how you terminate a loop, right? And, and so we modified the training a little bit, had a little special session to update people, and those errors disappeared from then on. So the, you look at error and say, where did this come from? It's not a bug that just crept in from the world of nature. It's something that people did and how come they're doing that? Okay. Now, I, I really like this idea because I think it forces us as programmers and managers and people who oversee them to take actual responsibility rather than feeling victimized by these things that creep in. But do you, in the past, I have actually expected that my programmers errors were fully preventable if they would just do a good enough job. I, I'm wondering if you think this is a correct view of things. Put it another way, you're a manager of programmers and, and you say, if they would do a good enough job, we could prevent errors. Well, number one, you'll never get perfection. We can't guarantee that in any, by anything we do. Uh, the laws of nature tell us that. Uh, second law of thermodynamics, if you go into that, tells you. But you can get closer and closer to error-free work. And it's not if they'd work better. See, if you go to the root cause, why don't they work better? And it comes back to you, the manager. You're not willing to spend the time and the money to reduce the errors to the level that you'll be satisfied with. In other words, you're looking for some kind of magical free thing, like I'll go in and I'll give them a lecture or I'll scream at them or I'll beat them with a stick or something and now they won't make so many errors. Uh, no, that's not the way it goes. You give them the resources that they need and let them know that what you're striving for and you can reduce error as low as you want if you're willing to pay for it. In the Mercury project, which was the first time that we ever had a computer program where a human life was dependent on, on directly on what we were doing, we, we set a standard uh, to reduce error way below what anybody had done before. And the history of the project and, and those things showed that we were able to produce an incredible error-free, almost error-free piece of software. And for many years, it's operated that way, okay? But 
the analysis of that, there have been a few articles about this, show that it costs more than most managers are willing to spend on their sales analysis program or their game program that they're doing or whatever. The, uh, I can't remember the numbers offhand. I may have it in the book, but it, you know, it, it, like it would cost hundreds of dollars per line of code when you got finished, whereas people don't want to spend that money. I mean, if you're writing a little game that people will play on their PC or on their handheld, so if it makes an error or two, and you just call that a feature of the game, and uh, why spend all this money? And that's that's okay, you know, if that's what you're doing. But if a human life is resting on the output of this machine, then uh, maybe we're willing to spend more money. But most managers, they don't understand a whole lot of what's going on. And the one thing they know how to do, no matter what you're doing, say, well, do the same thing, but do it cheaper. Right? Uh, anybody can do that. You don't have to be a very smart manager to say that. You know, just save us some money or do it faster. Right? Or do it better. Well, do it better. They don't know what that means exactly. But so you're just speaking to the wind when you do that kind of thing. You've got to be specific and say, "Here's here's what we're, we're going to do it better." Means so and so, and and you can't just do that by saying, uh, "I want a, a smaller bug count," which we hear a lot. You know, a lot of people are measuring their so-called bug count. And they say, we reduce the bug count. Well, counting errors is not an effective measure, right? You have to look at the consequences of errors. And a lot of the problem comes because of, uh, I don't want to call it, it's kind of pushing the consequences on somebody else, right? If you develop a product, well, for example, I had a, uh, a word processor that I used years ago that crashed and lost all my writing. You know, if I didn't save regularly, it lost all my writing, and it did this at random times, several times a day, right? Well, that was was a failure of the system. But it didn't cost the producers anything. It cost the users something. And if if you looked at the number of users there were and how often this kind of thing was happening, it was costing the world, if you like, billions or trillions of dollars, okay? But the, the only way it would cost the producers was if the word got out that it wasn't very reliable and people had alternatives and they, and they stopped buying this product, then it would cost them. But see, now that's very indirect. Here I'm writing code today, and two years from now, the word comes back that people are not buying this word processor because you have left a lot of errors in it. So go ahead and change your process now to improve. Well, it's sort of too late now. You've got a bad reputation. So so you don't connect the consequences of the error with anything that you're doing today. Right. So you mentioned bug count as not being an optimal way to measure the quality of the, the really how well put together your software is, uh, because as you say, uh, you may not be experiencing that. So is there a way to tell if my team is making too many errors? Is, is there an, a, an approach you would advocate for? Well, I think you, it really depends on the users of the software. In other words, you don't know what quality is unless you're a user of the software, right? What's quality to one person is irrelevant to another person. Uh, I remember going to an auto show in New York many, many years ago. We were going to move out of New York and living in Manhattan. We didn't own a car. You don't want to have a car in Manhattan. Uh, but we were going to move to Michigan and we were looking around for a car, so the auto show looked like a good place to go look and see what's available. And uh, walking around, we came to the Rolls-Royce exhibit, and uh, uh, we weren't in the market for Rolls-Royce. We knew that, but I couldn't resist. I went over, and I ran my hand over the finish on the Rolls, 
and it was a real, a real sensual experience. I mean, I read about uh, how many layers of lacquer they did and how much polishing they did. But I mean, feeling this guy, I can't describe it except if you haven't done it. But it was clearly a different level of finish. And I, I was interested in that because my father was in the auto painting business and I used to paint cars. So to me, this was incredible quality. Okay. To you who, were, who never painted a car or whatever, might think this was just an extravagance and not worth anything. Right? So I produce a piece of software. It's like producing a certain finish on a car. You use it and you say, it's fine. It does what I want. Yeah, it fails once in a while, but it's not, not a big deal to me. To me, the same piece of software might be totally unacceptable. So in order to really measure the quality of something you're producing, you've got to get a substitute or a surrogate of your user somehow. You've got to somehow get into the point of view of the people who will be using it and try it out, and they will tell you whether it's adequately error-free or uh, low error or whatever you want to call it. But for the programmers themselves to measure it is impossible. For the managers to measure it is impossible unless they are also users of the, of the same software. So if we sort of imagine then that in the same way as beauty is in the eye of the beholder, quality is in the eye of the user, it sounds like, should we try and measure it? Uh, is it something to be measured? Is it just something to be asked for our users' opinions? Uh, how should we approach this? Well, asking their opinions is a measurement. Uh, I mean, you've got to be careful with the word measurement is... Uh, Thank you. Uh, th thrown around, right? It's, again, not precisely. And there's whole books about measurement, uh, which one ought to study, but the word is not is not used in a precise manner in our business. And uh, <laughs> what I uh, hear often is this quote of Lord Kelvin, who uh, said, uh, to measure is to know. Right? If you know how to measure a thing, then you really understand it. Well, maybe, maybe not. I, I also like to quote, when people quote that to me, I like to quote back to them. The same Lord Kelvin said back at the end of the 19th century that it would be impossible for a heavier-than-air machine to fly. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let me back up. How can a team who wants to improve their quality begin to incorporate users into that process? Well, uh, that, that's what they do. They've got to find some user, something, some people who represent their user population and work with them, right? Testing out as they go along, and hopefully building incrementally, is this satisfactory to you? And it goes both ways, by the way. You see, the, the programmers could be overly critical of their own code and, and say it's not very good quality when, in fact, their users would be quite happy with it. Uh, I had a client that was producing something for banks, and they had one bank customer, and they were developing the software for that. I don't want to give you too much detail because I have to keep confidentiality. Of course. But, but they, um, they were, uh, because of errors in their code that they saw, they didn't want to deliver the code to the bank that was their big customer. And I was called in to help them, you know, get rid of it. Well, the way they defined it, I was to help them get rid of these errors. Right? When I came in, I said, well, let's talk to the bank. Oh, they were afraid to talk to the bank because they didn't want the bank to know about all the errors that they made. And I said, we're going to get them out first. And they were good. But that would mean that we would be delivering months behind the schedule that we had. Well, I said, let's talk to the bank. As an intermediary, I'll try to soften and everything. And they were afraid the bank would cancel the contract and everything. Well, the bankers were very upset because they weren't getting delivery of this thing. 
And I explained to them, well, they don't want to deliver it because it has certain errors. And they said, well, we don't care. We're not going to actually use the thing in, in the bank until we train all our tellers how to use it. And we can train them with the software that has these programmer errors in it. We can train them. It'll take months to train them. And if it makes a few errors in the training, it doesn't matter. But if we don't have it to use, then we can't train them. And then when the time comes to install it, they won't be trained and that won't be any good. So you see here, the programmers were thinking this thing was a, not of adequate quality. The bank was thinking it was not delivered on time. It was of fine quality for training purposes. So you see, without actually contacting it, and this is a thing I see over and over again, programmers, often their managers, don't want to talk to their users. They, they have all kinds of reasons. Uh, they're afraid, like in this case, the users will see errors we made in the process that we correct, but that we don't want them to see that we made any errors at all. Or they are worried that if we talk to our customers, our users, they will keep asking for more features and uh, we won't be able to control this. Well, that's where you start. Uh, if, if you want really quality stuff, you have to have contact with the people who are going to tell you whether it's quality or not. I mean, that doesn't seem to require a, a brilliant mind to figure that out, but it seems to be something we don't do. I like what you said about people wanting the customer or the user to have the impression that something has no errors at all. I see this a lot as well, and that also delays delivery as well as creates a huge apprehension that if the person who I'm showing it to you sees an error, they will have a negative reaction towards me. But do you think we should be representing the software as error-free? Is that something that's that we should do? No, I, <laughs> year, years ago, my mind is going in several directions. And once years ago at IBM, we had the IBM 650 computer, which was one of the first ones that I worked with. And it was based on vacuum tubes. So the, the, in those days, before transistors, the machines made more errors than they do now. And IBM had a sales slogan that said, uh, IBM 650 had never made an undetected error. That's quite a sales pitch. Yeah, it is. But if you think about it, you realize it's totally meaningless drivel, right? How would they know <laughs> if you had an undetected error? How would you know you had it? Because you couldn't detect it. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, so of course, that's the sales pitch. But we'd be better off. All right, now that may be another thing I thought of. When I first got married, my father gave me a piece of advice, which I'll never forget. He said, if your wife... And of course, he would know these. He was assuming that the woman did all the cooking and so on, you know, which is not exactly a modern point of view. But he said, if your wife cooks a meal for you and you don't like it, tell her that. Don't hide that because you love her, you don't want her to feel bad, and this and that. Tell her, otherwise, you're going to get the same meal over and over again through your whole married life. All right. You see the relevance of that? I do. And as a married person, I can say I would agree with that. Telling your wife the fifth time you didn't like it is received far differently than the first time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, same thing. If you don't have this feedback connection uh, with the producers of what you're eating or using as a software, then it is not going to get any better. Right. Absolutely. So I'm curious, have you seen that, switching topics here a bit, are there some languages or technologies that are less error prone than others? No. Just flat no? No. I mean, the technology is, well, is, well I suppose you could be using a a compiler that's got lots of errors in the compiler. But I mean, the tools that we use, 
It's how you use them. I mean, it's like if, if uh, I have on my leg, on my left leg, a huge scar from where somebody knocked a circular saw into my leg many years ago. It gave me a, a unique experience of being able to see the bone in my leg through this open wound. But the lesson I learned from that is that any tool can be used in a harmful way. It's not the tool, it's the way you use it. Um, we used to write code in binary, and uh, we often produced relatively error-free code because the way we, the things we did uh, to make sure. And one of the things that, um, yeah, I suppose uh, a tool could encourage you. We were worried when people started working with terminals and going online, timeshared systems, that uh, programmers could correct errors so quickly that they would get careless. And that happens. Some programmers are careless. You're working with your PC or your Mac, and okay, I just write anything, and if it's wrong, I'll fix it later, because uh, that's real easy. We, we had a turnaround time. We were in California, and our computer was in New York City, this was before jet planes. We would fly a box of punch cards to New York. Uh, it would be picked up at the airport, and taken to downtown, and run on the computer. And then we'd get the result. We punched in the cards, and put in a box, and mailed uh, on a plane back to us in California. It took about a week to turn it around. So to us, the consequences of making a mistake was a delay of a whole week. Right. Then we thought, if you just sit there at the machine and fix things as on the fly, then there's no real consequence to you as a programmer to making mistakes. And so you'd get careless. And sure enough, some programmers working on a Mac or PC are very careless, right? Produce a lot of errors, do a lot of correcting, and they tend to leave a lot more errors in because they had more to begin with. But other programmers can work with great discipline at a PC or a Mac and don't do that. So it isn't the environment. It isn't the tools, the compilers, the uh, testing tools that make these errors. It's the people and how they use them. Uh, in the same way, I mean, I, I, I go into a shop and uh, I, not anymore, but I used to be, uh, did a lot of woodworking, a lot of carpentry, and some uh, furniture building and so on. And I'd go to a place and I'd see somebody taking a chisel and opening a paint can with it. And it would just make me shudder. I mean, that's a misuse of a tool. But it, is it the chisel's fault that some moron is using it to open a paint can? No. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Another part that I hear a lot of people talk about when it comes to quality and bugs and errors is test automation. Do you view that as something that's really reduced errors dramatically? No. It's how you use the particular kind of automation you're using. I, what I tell people about automation is it's an effort reducing thing. You could do everything that automation does by hand, right? but it will cost more to do it. Uh, automation makes certain parts of testing easier and cheaper, all right? When it's easier and cheaper, you can do things faster, and it could make you careless, or it could be used very well. Either way, and I've seen both things happen with test automation. It's like... Uh, a friend of mine, another woodworker, got a, a new power saw. And I said, oh, it's great. It makes, you know, better work. He says, well, actually, what it does is makes it possible to make a lot of scrap wood a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and test automation could do that. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing when you're testing, you get a tool to do it faster, then you just make mistakes faster. Some people use test automation tools as if it's waterfall. They, they set down in advance all these tests that, that somehow 
before they know what they're doing, is going to test things adequately. And you can't do that. Generally speaking, you can't do that. I mean, yes, we want to test first, and, and that's something we've always preached and always done, is think in advance how you're going to test something, right? But don't waterfall it. That's I mean, because you think in advance, you do the best you can, and then you adapt as you go along and say, oh, well, we tested all this stuff, we automated these tests, but look at what we've missed, or what we're missing. We're not going to see this kind of error, we're not going to see. So we do uh, context-driven testing, plus automation where we can. And all these things come down to people looking for a magic solution, right? Very true. Managers will just say, test everything. You know, well, anybody could say that, right? That would be wonderful if you could do it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do that, but you can't do it. It's impossible. And even in the simplest program to test everything. Any program you've got, something you want to program, and you tell me, here's how we're going to test it. And I can write a program in such a way that your tests will miss the mistakes that it's making. You can always do that. And it's something that we've known, Charles Babbage, and I, I assume your listeners know who Charles Babbage was. If they don't, they should look it up. 150 years ago, knew this, right? That you could, you could never test quality into a program. You could do any number of tests, and no matter how many tests you did, and literally millions and billions of tests, you could always miss some error, some fault in the program. So testing has to be adapted. It cannot be 100% automated. That makes sense. And the last few answers you've given me have a theme that the people involved are very important, that tools and process and there is no silver bullet or magic answer. So I'm curious, what advice do you have for engineers who might be listening who want to create fewer errors in their own work? First thing pops into my mind is the slogan, uh, many eyes makes fewer errors, right? Nobody that I've ever met, and, and I've met some incredible programmers, uh, nobody is good enough to see all the mistakes that they make. So you want to get other people involved. There are various ways of doing this. But you have to be open to feedback and seek feedback from other people. Just like, you know, I write a book and I think it's terrific. I, I read a paragraph. I think this really explains something. I don't know if it really does that unless I test it on other people. Right? So expose your work to as many other people as are willing to give it a good look, all right? Related to that is, is of course, use, use whatever tools you've got. Uh, expose it to the, quote, eyes of the tools, uh, but don't count on it. Uh, as that's all you have to do. When I was leading a programming team, for example, in the Mercury Project, we had a guy who was supposed to be really good but he, he didn't like our ideas of reviewing each other's code. And uh, I had to release him from the project. It wasn't good enough. I had a client where we introduced our various methods of doing this, reviewing code, testing other people's work. And uh, there's a, a large number of uh, programmers, uh, five or six hundred. And three of them said they wouldn't do this. They said, nobody can look at my work. I'll, be, I'll look at other people's work, but nobody can look at my work. You know, it's like somehow my work is a, is a trap. It isn't yours. You're doing it for somebody else, right? Yes, if I'm writing a piece of code here on my own machine for my own use, I can do whatever I want. I can have errors in it or I can love it. It doesn't matter, right? But if you're working on a job, building code for somebody, uh, it doesn't belong to you. You're being paid to produce it. So they have three, but they have three guys, all guys, who wouldn't uh, accept this. And so uh, they didn't know what to do. The managers didn't know what to do. And I said, here's what we'll do. 
uh, will accept that they say, they say, you know, each of them said, I don't make mistakes, right? And so we said, okay, here's what we'll do. You can work by yourself. You don't have to use the methods that we're talking about. You don't have to have this feedback. But if one of the pieces of code that you write makes an error and it costs us a certain amount, then we'll deduct that from your salary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I said that to the three guys. The first one said, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. I'll do what you want. I mean, he, he realized at some level that his ego was, was a little overstated and uh, he couldn't afford, you know, to have to pay for his errors. The second one, the, second, the other two said, okay, you know, we'll do that, right? So the first one of them, the first program that he wrote failed, cost them a substantial amount of money, and they came to him and they said, well, you now owe us more than you're going to earn in the next few years, uh, but we'll be glad to let you go without paying. <laughs> 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 and so he was gone, which they realized was a good thing. Uh, this guy was sprinkling errors in everything he did and taking no responsibility for them. So the third guy took the deal, and he produced, for over six months, he produced various pieces of code, and nothing ever went wrong with them. You know, and this guy was really good. I mean, he was one of the handful of the very best programmers that I had ever run across. And uh, he worked very precisely. He had his own methods, right, which were very sophisticated, but he didn't let other people look at his work. But then finally, I think it was after seven or eight months, he had one little mistake that happened to wipe out uh, an uh, important database. And they came to him and they said, look, you know, you're going to have to work for the rest of your life for free you know, based on this deal that we have. You know, uh, what do you want to do? And they, they thought... They could do what they did with that second guy and just fire him, right? But then they thought, you know, he's really good. He really knows a lot. He's not perfect. He's a human being. So we made a deal and we said, look, you see what happened. Uh, you don't make very many mistakes. You're much better than everybody else. So we want to use you to train the other people to work the way you do, precisely within the system that we're propagating of reviewing and so on. And, and if you do that, we won't, we won't charge you all this money. And, uh, and he, uh, he saw the logic of it and he agreed and he became an extremely valuable employee to the organization. So that kind of thing has happened over and over again. Uh, but if I, uh, it's a matter of personality. You know, uh, certain people are not cut out for being a programmer that works in a, a low error environment. And they, they shouldn't be programming anymore. I mean, if you had a surgeon who had palsy or something and couldn't steady his hands or her hands, you know, they might have good intentions. Uh, they may be nice people, but they just don't have what it takes to be a, a good surgeon. They may be killing patients. Right. Right. Now that makes sense. In that same theme of exposing your work, do you see that open source software, uh, that movement has yielded uh, increased quality? It has in some cases. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, again, uh, open source is a, is a blanket term and it covers a lot of different ways that things are done. But the concept has the possibility of producing much lower error rates than uh, some of the other traditional ways that, that uh, things are done. I mean, in a way, you see Agile, first of all, is team-based. Open source is team-based. But it, in either case, a team means that more than one set of eyes is looking at everything, right? You know, so you can, you can have a team where the people don't really work together as a team. 
Right? Calling it a team doesn't make it a team. Right? Calling it a leg doesn't make it a leg. Calling it open source doesn't make it really open. You know, again, some of the open source projects that I've seen are really like one person is doing it and other people look at it, but they don't listen to what they have to say or they don't look at it carefully. You know, you must have had the experience. You're reading a book and uh, you sort of wake up and say, oh, I'm 10 pages past where I was before. What did I just read? Sure. You know what I mean? You know, sure. your, your mind has to be engaged in it. And uh, looking at code is the same thing, right? You have to engage your mind. So our, what I look for in trying to build a good programming process is people who know how to engage their minds in what they're doing, who know how to recognize it. See, the team is not just looking at the code, but they're looking at each other and what they're doing. And so they said, you know, I did review this, but I, that was a bad day. My dog was sick, and uh, the credit card company said I owed them a lot of money, and I, all these things were on my mind. And yeah, I passed my eyes over this piece of code, but I wasn't really engaged in it. So you can't really rely on what I said, and let's do it over again. Okay. And that's human beings. I mean, that's what we do. Absolutely. I, I think we've learned the uh, the pitfall of trusting in magic labels like open source and agile and automation and um, really heard that it comes down to the individual and their approach uh, and the their willingness to uh, accept their own imperfections. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the way you said that. As we wrap up here, do you see any trends uh, coming that will radically change software quality uh, maybe in the next 10 to 20 years? Okay. So let's start answering that again with the same argument. The term software is a broad term and covers millions of things. When, when Apple came out with the iPad, their ads said that there were 600,000 programs for the iPad. 600,000 pieces of software. Now, do you think they were all the same? That's an excellent point. I have used that term very broadly. Yeah, and so software, I think what's happening is where people or management or whatever understands the need for a certain level of quality and is willing to put into getting it what is required, then we're going to, we're getting higher quality stuff. Right? Where they don't, you know, they they don't realize what they need to have a saleable product or a usable product, or they realize it but they don't they're not willing to spend what then, then we're not going to get higher quality. Now, where they do realize it, and they're willing to spend, then the knowledge that we have about how to do it becomes relevant. But if you're not willing to do it, it doesn't matter if you know how to do it. Right? I mean, I, there's been some discussion recently about some of my books on Twitter and stuff. And I've had several people have told me, they said, Oh, yeah, your book, you know, people say, oh, Jerry's books are wonderful, blah, blah. And so, oh, yeah, I bought his book. I uh, haven't read it. It's like, oh, you mean if you buy the book, somehow you get better? Uh, I'd like to convince people of that because I'd make a lot of money. Right? All you have to do is buy my book and then you'd be smarter. But you do have to actually read it. And the same thing with these ideas about quality. Test automation. Agile teams, whatever, this tool or that tool, whatever it is, knowing the name and saying the name doesn't improve your quality at all. It's like putting the book under your pillow and exactly expecting all the knowledge to come up because you know the, you know the new magic word. It would be great. I mean, it would, it would be wonderful if you could do that, right? I'd get a lot more books read. Yeah. Jerry, is there anything I've forgotten to ask you? Uh, anything more you'd like to add as we're wrapping up? Well, I'm sure there's things you've forgotten, right? We know that from our, our whole discussion. I am imperfect. And there are things that I've forgotten to tell you, right? 
So it's a continuing process. I, I guess this, I maybe conclude by saying, if you want to, if you're a programmer listening to this, or a tester listening to this, or a manager listening to this, the big lesson is commit yourself to getting feedback and continuously using that feedback, discarding some of it that doesn't apply, but engaging with it and then modifying your behavior and keep improving your whole life long. I mean, I've been in the software business uh, or the, the computer business for over now 70 years now, starting when I was a computer. And uh, I'm better now than I used to be because I keep uh, looking to improve. Uh, when I look for assignments, and uh, I, I'm asking myself, will I learn things in this assignment? If I won't, then I'll do something else. So commit yourself to continuous learning and realizing you'll never be perfect, but you'll get better and better. Wonderful. Jerry, where can people find more about you and your work and your books? Well, probably just go to my website to start. Actually, not just my website. There was a, a very nice, there's a couple people who sort of follow my work and uh, they have interviews with me uh, and uh, lists of various books and articles and so on. So there's my website, uh, GeraldMWeinberg.com. It's important to have the M for my middle initial because some pirates uh, have taken the site named Gerald Weinberg without the M, and they're selling some junk there. Well, we'll put the links in the show notes. Okay. Jerry, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's been fun. I hope it's useful to people. I'm sure it will be. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can write comments on each episode on the website or write a review on iTunes. Mention or message us on Twitter, at SE Radio, or search for the Software Engineering Radio Group on LinkedIn, Google+, or Facebook. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Thanks again for your support.